Live. I believe we are live now. <laughs> um, okay, so hello everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Um, again, my name is Stokely and I work with HowlRound Theater Commons. Uh, so this is the second time HowlRound is doing a live streamed virtual panel on Zoom. And we've been trying them out as a way to help conversations um, that are global, accessible and done in real time. So thank you so much Viviana for approaching us with this fabulous panel idea. Um, so we think uh, that, you know, we'd love to start more of these conversations like this. Um, and we think this is a really important conversation, especially to have around the future of crowdfunding um, with artists of color um, and anyone who is passionate about a subject and who believes they have a topic that's a learning for the field is welcome to pitch a Zoom conversation idea to us. So if you're interested in hosting a Zoom panel, you can reach out to us via the contribute page on haran.com. And so folks watching at home, um, you can also join the conversation today by using the hashtag Haran on Twitter or by leaving a comment in the comment section. And we've already got a couple of those, which is great. So I'm just gonna introduce your moderator, moderator Viviana. Excuse me. So Viviana Yurasapi Vargas Saltaviera is a two-spirit indigenous Latinx artist, activist, and arts manager. They work with others who are passionate about changing the world specifically through the medium of storytelling and by creating liberated spaces that uplift marginalized voices and experiences. They manage our Advancing Arts Forward, a movement to advance equity, inclusion, and social justice through the arts. Yurasapi is currently working on a decolonization project throughout Latin America, specifically in Quechua communities of what is current day Ecuador. They are a cycle four fellow of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute's Innovative Cultural Advocacy Fellowship and part of Art Equity's 2018 National Facilitator Training Cohort. They hold an MFA from Brooklyn College and a BFA from Boston University. Cool. So. Without further ado, take it away, Viviana. Amazing, yes, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just wanna start off by acknowledging that we all as panelists are on stolen indigenous land, both in now what is known as North and South America, which is where I am at today. Um, so I just wanna take a moment for us to honor the original ancestors and offer respect to indigenous people who are still here on the lands around the world and around the world, um, knowing that this is only one point of a longer journey of healing from settler colonialism. Yupai Chani, thank you. Uh, I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the end of Black History Month yesterday, which we, where we have taken time reflecting, honoring, celebrating, and healing from the history of anti-Blackness racial injustice in the US. Um, and here where I am in Latin America and around the world, and also acknowledging the history and truth that anti-Blackness still exists today, um, both within white folks and people of color because of white supremacy. Uh, it's also the first day of March, which we celebrate as Women's History Month and Development Disabilities Awareness Month. Deaf History Month is also beginning on March 13th, later this month. Um, although we don't have an ASL interpreter on now, we are gonna have the conversation transcribed um, for available for later viewing on the same page that it's on now on HowlRound. So overall, it is a great day for collective liberation, uh, meaning that I am not free until you are free and we are all here and we can work to support historically and currently marginalized communities through the arts. And that's what Advancing Arts Forward is about. That's the movement, the company that I started and partnered today here with HowlRound to have this conversation. Um, I, yes, I go by Viviana Vargas, Salvatierra, also Yurasapi, which means roots of the tree in Quechua, which is one of the living indigenous languages of various people here in Ecuador, where I am today. Um, and the spark for this conversation in particular, the future of crowdfunding for theater artists of color, began late last year after the Movement Theater Company ended their Kickstarter campaign, their historic hashtag 25K in 25 days campaign and I interviewed them and Deidre and Eric are here representing the producing artistic leadership team on how they did this campaign, how they were successful in doing and raising $25,000 in 25 days. Uh, and then that discussion kind of developed, evolved after speaking with Jessica Mastert, who is also here and the staff at HowlRound. 
um, into what it is now, this opportunity for us to have a live panel conversation uh, with different theater artists who have been successful in different platforms of crowdfunding. Um, and so I'd like to just offer a moment for each of you who are on here with me today to introduce yourselves. Uh, the question I'll ask here is tell us about yourself and briefly about your experience crowdfunding for theater. And if it could be one to two minutes per person, and then we'll get more into details throughout the conversation. But again, tell us about yourself and briefly about your experience crowdfunding for theater. Um, so I'll start with Paul. Uh, hello, everybody. My name's Paul Flores. I'm a theater maker here in San Francisco. Um, I consider myself Latino, uh, Mexican, Cubano, um, and have been working in the Latino community here, uh, developing all kinds of different arts opportunities for people uh, in the Bay Area since 1995, since I started working and helped co-found Youth Speaks. Um, moved over to La Peña Cultural Center, was working there. Uh, and now I currently am an independent artist and uh, make theater by collaborating with other organizations um, all over the United States and internationally, um, mostly the uh, Latino based uh, content with other Latino artists, um, but certainly reach out to the immigrant um, community, uh, as well as the African American community, the Latinx community. Um, and through my, my history of making theater, I've done a couple of different crowdfunding um, projects. The most recent one that I've done um, that I'm doing right now, so yes, you can check out my online stuff right now, is Patreon. Um, I am raising funds for a, a project that is premiering May 10th through 12th at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco called We Have Ide, which is about uh, Afro-Cuban immigrant artists in the United States and uh, Cuban-American experience here. Um, so I've been working with Patreon for about a year. So I just want to give kudos for you guys raising 25 grand <laughs> in 25 days. That is like amazing um, uh, to uh, movement theater. That's dope. Uh, I've been working with uh, Patreon for a year and through all the total kind of, um, I guess, uh, different donation uh, routes, I've raised a little bit over 11 grand. Um, and uh, I don't know if you want me to talk about Patreon right now, Viviana, or just mention men mention what, that I work on Patreon uh, doc, uh, Patreon com. I think that's good for now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's go to Kit. Hi everyone. My name is Kit. I use they, she, and he, and I am a writer. Um, I write plays, musicals, screenplays, some poetry. Um, this. My experience with crowdfunding uh, most recently, um, though I will say that I have crowdfunded and um, done community uh, type engagements pretty much like throughout my um, maybe like 10 year career now. Um, this past summer, we raised uh, just shy of $80,000 in uh, cash and in-kind donations, um, probably like $70,000 in cash um, to go to Interstate, which was a, a musical that was in the New York Musical Festival. And it uh, we had a team of uh, about 40 women, trans folks, queer folks, people of color working on this musical. Um, we did it through uh, a whole mix of, of platforms. Um, and a lot of people worked on it. So I'm, I'm here, but the people who are not here that were working on this um, were those 40 folks. And then also my musical collaborator, Melissa Lee and three producers. Um, we, we did it on Kickstarter, um, Fractured Atlas. And on Fractured Atlas, we did a bunch of uh, just like individual outreach type emails. And um, we also had a sponsorship from the Musical Theater Factory. Oh, and we currently um, use Drip to, to do ongoing um, crowdfunding. And we worked with Jessica, which was very exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah why don't we go to Jessica next? 
Hey, I'm Jessica. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I've been working in theater, dance, performance art for about the past decade, mostly as an arts administrator, um, kind of focusing on marketing communications or storytelling, audience engagement. Um, I like to help people think about how to frame a piece, how to share it out into the world. Before I joined Kickstarter, I did run two crowdfunding campaigns. Um, on a couple of different platforms, if we're being honest. So I've gone through the experience myself, but these days I'm really, most of my job here at Kickstarter is focusing on the one-to-one -one helping artists and companies figure out how crowdfunding fits into their process and how to incorporate it more smoothly into what they're doing. Um, so I do that one-to-one. -one. I'm also inside Kickstarter an advocate for the field. In the day-to-day, -day, this looks like can we get this artist on the homepage? Can we get somebody into a newsletter? But also means things like looking at the product and how can we change it and make it better for people in theater and introducing initiatives like the one we just launched this week called Performance in Progress. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Movement. Let's look at that. Yes, folks at the movement. Hey, I'm Eric Lockley, um, and, and I'm Deidre Harrington. <laughs> we're both producing artistic <laughs> leaders of the Movement Theater Company. Uh, we used um, this fall, we did a Kickstarter campaign um, for our production of What to Send Up When It Goes Down, which is by Alicia Harris, um, directed by Whitney White. And we raised a little over 25K in a little over 25 days. But you know, to what the hashtag 25K in 25 days sounds great. Yeah. So um, that's what we went with. And it raised about, what, 20% of our production budget, I think. Um, but also was a really great sort of uh, platform in, uh, in way for us to continue getting continued support to raise the rest of the budget um, for the show and to, um, and huge, huge, huge props to Jessica who just like encouraged us in those, in those dark days of trying to get the campaign off the ground. Um, Eric, you wanna talk a little bit about the movement? And yeah, yeah. Um, so the Movement Theater Company, we're committed to uh, supporting artists of color and creating uh, social artistic movement through the works that we do. So we're really looking at the intersection of social justice and art and creating uh, opportunities for bold new voices to be out there. And uh, within the context of crowdfunding, one of the big things that we uh, discovered or took advantage of is that content is definitely so important. Uh, just being able to create various pictures, videos, as much as you can to keep people engaged was really helpful for us. And it also gave us an opportunity to showcase the different sides of ourselves as a organization and as a community of artists. Um, so that's one thing that I know you mentioned, uh, something that we could share. I think that's a huge thing that was really helpful for our process. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess to start off, keeping it simple, I'd say, Let's talk about what is crowdfunding. What does it mean to you and what can it mean for an artist or producer and or producer? I might just jump in quickly to give a very straightforward from within description and then I'm very excited to hear from all of you artists, but I think crowdfunding to, to me, and I'd say to us a bit at Kickstarter, is about relationships. It is about fundraising, yes, and I think that's what we lean on currently when we think about crowdfunding as an opportunity, but it's about sharing what you're working on and engaging with the community. Um, when you're looking at even just calling it crowdfunding, there's a crowd there, there's a community. Um, so it's, it's all of that. It's funding, it's promotion, it's storytelling, it's engagement. I'd offer that up to get us started. I think it's basically asking your friends for money. Um, <laughs> that's uh, really kind of what it is and pretty much bothering them until <laughs> uh, you get as much as you can to, to uh, produce your project. I, I do think um, when we're talking about crowdfunding in theater, um, we're, we're aiming at all donations or, or um, support to go towards our projects and not necessarily towards, you know, taking a vacation or, 
you know, paying for um, a trip here or there, it's usually goes directly back into the project, which means the money I'm, re I'm receiving is actually going back out to the people in my project. So that's also a crowd right there of folks that, that we are uh, sourcing um, and resourcing. The money comes in from our friends and actually goes to other friends. Um, I actually like that. I, I feel like I love paying artists. It's, um, I'd love to pay them more. It's not always easy to pay them more, uh, but certainly um, the, the idea of crowdfunding is being is like kind of throwing out, to me it means like throwing out opportunities for your friends to support the work that you do financially to possibly actually support them at the same time. Um, and I, I do agree with what the, our family over at Movement said about um, providing a lot of content so people know um, what it is that they're supporting on and how it evolves over a certain amount of time. I, um, I know Kickstarter has a, a determined end when you have to finish um, the, 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 the uh, request or the, the project, funding project, um, uh, in order to qualify for it. But I, I did hear several people say they work on different platforms. And I think that that's also really important too, is to think about, you know, how many, how many different communities can we ask to get involved in our projects um, at the same time, <laughs> just so we can reach our goals. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah, it was during our campaign, an artist and friend of ours, Stacey Rose, she mentioned, she posted online that she gave us like, I don't know, $20 or whatever. And this a whole concept of actually, we're all just like passing around mm -hmm. the same $25, you know, it's like, she gave us $25. And then it's like, great, like, here's my $25. And she had a campaign, yes, she she had had a campaign, campaign. you know, and we're like, okay, gonna pass that $20 right back to you. And it is, it's this whole, it's this whole cycle of like, more than just like, money and funding, which, you know, Jessica is what you mentioned too, is that it's also just about like a sharing of resources. How can we really start to think about, you know, crowdfunding beyond just money too, right? It's like, we need space, we need materials. And how can we just continue this new sort of ecology um, to support the arts and the work that we want to create in the communities and artists that we want to serve? Yeah. Um, to that, that was a really beautiful way of thinking about crowdfunding as like a giving circle. Um, Cause that's sort of like the folks that participate in crowdfunding are definitely the folks that are, you know, giving and receiving in, in like cyclical ways. Um, to me, crowdfunding is about giving our communities an opportunity to participate at every level and treating all the levels um, as like very important contributions, whether that's like, you know, time, time and, and labor or $1 to $10,000. Um, for me, when I think about our, our musical, particularly Interstate, um, that is on sort of like a, 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 a typical musical trajectory. Um, I think about crowdfunding as a way to subvert commercial theater um, because uh, most folks are not able to, co to participate in commercial theater investments. And so for people to be a part of a project that um, at, at every single um, level is, is very important to us because our musical is about queer folks and trans folks and people of color. And um, we are not typically the ones who are investing in Broadway, um, but we are investing in each other's, each other's like culture. Um, yeah, thanks all. Um, next question, which is kind of related, I feel like we've kind of touched on moments of this, but, but why did you start crowdfunding and why should one crowdfund? <laughs> okay. Uh... Uh, I think the biggest thing is it, it is a wonderful platform, especially uh, for the ones that are familiar now, uh, that people, when you hear Kickstarter, when you hear Indiegogo, it's kind of automatic and there's a certain amount of trust um, associated with it. So I think that's helpful. Um, but in addition to that, it is in a, the age of social media, it's just so easy for someone to share, for someone to get a shout out. There's so many ways uh, that 
one action can reverberate so that other folks know, oh, this thing is going on. Um, so crowdfunding really helps in that way. And I think, especially for marginalized communities, um, it's an opportunity for uh, us to, like uh, I believe Kit said, operate outside of the systems that have been established that can uh, keep us out, to be quite honest. And I think uh, with social media platforms and with uh, more of us putting our voices out there, it is an opportunity to rally a community that exists and some of whom may be very familiar with donating in the process of donating, whether it's to theater or film, and some who may not be familiar with that. And that is a huge thing, is getting people who watch the video or see the photo and are like, this is interesting, but they have never been to your theater company or they've never seen any of your work, but they be suddenly become engaged in a different way because the crowdfunding allows for you to uh, meet people in different ways. Yeah, and I think also it's just like a part of the funding pie, right? We raised 20, a little over 25 grand on Kickstarter, but also like separately had to raise significant funds through grants and through other, you know, building other individual donations and, and, and relationships and things like that. And it's all about like, what are these different pies? Who are the different audiences that we're trying to reach? in order to garner support for the production and to like ultimately, you know, get money, right? Like that's, that's, that's why like we all turn to it, right? Is needing the funding and the resources to make the work happen. Yeah, anyone else want to speak to this idea? This idea of, you know, should people of color theater artists crowdfund and why? Um, I want to speak to the practicality of crowdfunding on a pre-existing platform. So when we, when we did our um, musical this past summer, um, we, we honestly didn't know if we were going to do a Kickstarter um, because we could have just kept crowdfunding like the way we were doing it by emailing all our friends and family and soliciting like donations and individual contributions. Um, but somebody has done all the work already of like creating a place for you to put your project up and then click through and deliver the product. And, and like make it really, really easy to, to donate. And I, I would say like just logistically, like if as like folks of color who are already like doing too many things to make our art within the system, like let somebody do the work for you sometimes is, is like the, the way we decide, like why we decided to, to do part of our, our fundraising through Kickstarter. Um, it also gave us visibility and access to people that wouldn't have found out about our project because by the time, you know, we, we will have exhausted all the folks that we know, um, but all of those folks know a lot more people. And so having um, Kickstarter and Drip gave the folks who had already given to our campaign through private methods um, a public interface to, to continue to, to let other folks know about it. Mm -hmm. Good problem. Yeah. I mean, I might add to that. I think the, the transparency around the goal and how many backers becomes a really good way to help incentivize people to give. Because with individual fundraising, you're sending out emails, it's great people engage. But when folks see that you are $30 away from your goal, like that instinct to chip in becomes different and to become part of a movement. So I think there's definitely that aspect to it. Um, and for better or worse on some platforms like Kickstarter where there's an all or nothing involved, there is that countdown that I think does drive people to be like, right, I've got two days left. I'm chipping in now or never, which the never part doesn't really happen. I find usually they circle back to you in one way or another, either on a different platform or with a check, they, they will find a way to support you. But I think that's really helpful with it. And maybe one of the reasons why within individual fundraising is one facet, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's always frightening for me, all or nothing. Oh my God, what if I don't get it? All that time and effort I put into asking all my friends and I was a thousand dollars short and now my 10 grand is gone. Um, that's my biggest criticism of Kickstarter. Um, 
it was that I, I, I felt like that's a lot of work to put in to not be rewarded directly. However, I don't know many people that don't get it. So I, I, I feel like you guys do a good job of supporting folks to make their, their goals. Um, I, I wanna just talk a little bit about why I, I like Patreon um, and how I came to it. First of all, um, it's really difficult for uh, theater artists of color to even get inside a theater. Um, particularly because uh, we usually represent a, a, a community that's not even in the theater in the first place. So for artists to get their work on stage is already a, a triple kind of um, barrier. Uh, we're not rich. We don't have a tradition of, of uh, proscenium style classic theater in our, you know, no one, and my mom and dad didn't take me to no theater shop. Um, so just our exposure is so, is so limited already. And then when we get into the theater, <laughs> The story is not even about us. So um, it's hard for us to kind of get connected to, to theater. You've got to really be a, a motivated person. Like I got stuff to say and I got to get it up there um, because there's going to be a plenty of forces that don't want you to get up there. Um, and money is one of them, but access is the other. Um, just getting on stage costs money to rent a theater. Um, and, I'm, and I'm coming at this from an independent um, theater producer's uh, perspective, although I've got almost 20 years of nonprofit art. So I know how to write grants. I know how to develop um, budgets and I know how to create uh, outcomes and all that stuff. That's definitely helpful. Um, but Patreon was, came to me through, through working with my life coach. So I have a life coach. She, she helps me basically organize my, um, my life and my schedule. And I told her, look, um, this project I'm working on is gonna be you know, evolving over a couple of years and we have to travel and half the, the, the people are on in New York and half are in San Francisco. Um, I can't wait a whole year for a grant money to come through. I need money now. Um, and, you know, when you write a grant for, you know, let's say $50,000, not only is it hard to, to get it, but you have to wait a long time um, for, the, for the check to come. In the meantime, what are you supposed to be doing? Um, and as, as an artist, I have to not only write the work, um, but I also got to raise the money. Patreon was cool because Patreon gives you money monthly. Um, and and if, you're, if you need access to funds right away, um, then it, it can be supportive of that. It's designed to give people updates on your work monthly. So for instance, I don't know that it was designed for theater artists. I got to be honest, it's more, I think it was designed for like cartoonists, musicians to say, I'm going to release this, this um, or filmmakers, I'm gonna release this part so you can see what we're working on. Um, I have to document all my work in, in theater in order to let people know what I'm doing. So it's extra work, I gotta say, you know, you wanna maintain a, 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 a crowdsourcing thing, it's gonna be uh, extra work, but it's your work and you have control of it. It's freedom, it's independence um, from a lot of the companies and the 501c3s um, who hold up your money or who hold up your opportunities to to pursue to produce and and and, uh, and create so I do think that there is freedom in it um, there's independence in it and there's resistance in it and um, uh, I, I don't know because because money is such a big deal in creating theater and theater is expensive theater is expensive it's hard to do it all by yourself um, so you have to pay people to help you so you're gonna have to find the money for it um, and so patreon was 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 perfect for me. Uh, to 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 handle expenses um, that weren't huge, like if I needed to buy a ticket somewhere real quick, if I needed to pay an artist to come in for rehearsal for a week, um, there's possibilities of of, uh, of of having that money available right away. Um, so for what I'm doing, it fits my purpose. I don't know if everybody uh, it would fit their 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 purpose on how they develop work. I think funding is also related to how you develop how you develop work, what's your strategy, um, what are your deadlines, and, and how are you gonna meet the expenses? And yeah. just a question, Kit and Paul, cause Paul, you use Patreon and Kit, you said that you use Drip, which are, and, and so just like how much money do you all end up raising sort of like monthly through both of those platforms, just in terms of like this idea of keeping an ongoing thing going and, and having a platform for that. We just we just started using Drip, and Drip was our follow up campaign to the Kickstarter. So Drip is Kickstarter's monthly product, um, and I would say 
there's like a there's like a trial period. Jessica, like, help correct me if I'm wrong anywhere here, but there's like a trial period in which you can all incentivize your early um, backers, and you can make like a special level that's like a founding member level. Um, we we currently raise about two hundred dollars a month on Drip, uh, but we we haven't really done a huge push for it yet. Um, and we haven't had a lot of experience working with it. Um, but I think, you know, we want to, to keep using it so that our folks um, can subscribe to any monthly updates that we have. I probably raised between five and $600 a month. Um, and in my campaign, I put in it that I was gonna run it until May, until the premiere. Um, I don't know if I'll continue, I probably will. Um, but the, the thing about it is, is that you're, you're constantly, you know, looking for people to, to support it. Um, but I, I've been really fortunate. I feel like just having five or $600 more a month that goes directly to the project. There's all kinds of, of things that you can, you can do with that. And I only have 20 or 25, uh, you know, patrons. Um, if I had a couple of other people working with me, and this is all me, I do it by myself, all of it by myself. Nobody's helping me with this. Um, if I had three or four people, you know, pushing a Patreon campaign, you could get thousands a month. Yeah. So it sounds like we're talking about these like different platforms, different, um, opportunities, different, that kind of match with what, what it is that you're working on. So for example, if you are, yes, developing a piece throughout, you know, months, maybe a recurring platform is something that is more beneficial for you. But if, if you're, you know, working on a one-time production, crowdfunding, maybe that's the best thing. You can do the one month cam or campaign in 25 days, or you set a time limit there. Um, but yeah, any, we want to talk more about these differences of these different kinds of platforms recurring and one-time kind of donation. And then also that difference between Kickstarter and other uh, platforms where it's all or nothing um, and perhaps as well starting to talk about what has worked well in those different experiences for you and your experience crowdfunding um, yeah anyone want to I, I want to just jump in and follow up um, a little bit in uh, in terms of talking about our monthly subscribers um, to further answer your question Deidre because um, we don't have any ongoing work. Like we had a musical and it'll premiere somewhere in the future, like in 2020 or 2020, you know, it's, it's a musical, so you know how it goes. Um, but our folks from the Kickstarter who want, wanted to keep contributing or wanted to make maybe like a larger contribution, but then their time ran out. I think those are the folks that are our drip subscribers and there are monthly con like, contributors, even though we don't have anything going on. Um, and I think that's really useful for us because like, you know, we will need that someday and we're really transparent about what we're going to do. You know, like on the horizon, there'll be an album. Like on the horizon, we may need to fly in a, a you know, a TGNC identified actor and enhance the production somewhere. Like, you know, those things are coming um, and our subscribers sort of like know, like, I feel like they're just like in good faith, like part of our membership, which is I, I think like a really beautiful thing um, to speak a little bit to your question as well, Viviana. If I could add a question onto that, because I think the, the work that goes into communicating with your audience on the regular is one thing, leading up to a show, in between shows, but when it comes to a monthly subscription, um, Kit and Paul, have you found yourselves having to create additional content beyond what you would normally do? Is it taking up more time? Just curious. Um, I think I've learned a lot, uh, particularly by, by doing um, a crowdfunding project like Patreon, um, I always get caught up in, in the rewards you give people. Like, you know, what should I give folks to get them to donate? Like the work I'm doing isn't already a gift, but um, you know, there's the whole idea of what, you know, what should you give the rewards? And 
I was giving people Cuban rum and 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 uh, and cigars, but now I ran out. So I have to find new um, new things to give them. And plus, I got to get to Cuba every time, so that's hard. Uh, but those things those things uh, stick in my head, you know. Like, what should I offer people? Um, and then you know, um, I I was reading <laughs> uh, Alexandria uh, uh, Acosta, our Congress lady, reading what she was saying is like. You know, tell people straight up what you want to do and tell them, you know, tell them straight what it is that you're doing. And sometimes that can work, too. You don't always have to offer like straight up rewards. Um, so a lot of time my thinking is how do I get new people on board? Right. Um, but I'm also thinking, what can I tell people straight about this project that is honest about well, you know, not, not only why it's important, but why I'm doing it? What does it relate to? Um, in my experience or in the world. Uh, so then whatever I, I decide that I want that message to be, then I usually look for something that matches that, whether it's a photo, whether it's an excerpt from the piece, um, whether it's a, a video. Um, so I am taking a lot more video content now than I, I think ever have in the past. Um, luckily, I hired a videographer to document everything that we do. Um, so, and I didn't think about, oh, we need that for Patreon. <laughs> I did that because we were traveling all over Cuba to, to research and I wanted the, I wanted the footage and it was dope. Um, and then that, that happened to be able to be really useful for saying, hey, look, this is what it looks like, what we're doing. So I, I, do, I do think that there is a, um, an investment on, on um, documentation, on technology, uh, on how to use like Patreon on my phone, um, and you know, just to understand it more. Uh, so, but I think everybody's got to be able to do that nowadays. Like, if you, you got to be uh, adept with video and with technology um, and mobile technology and quick technology, um, but it does serve serve to to help uh, um, raise funds if you're thinking about direct message and being honest with what you want people to to know about your project. Um. We're not that great at creating content to just to be really honest with you. <laughs> like once a month, if Melissa and I are doing a residency somewhere, we'll like share a clip of a new song or we'll like just write some text along with like a photo of us. <laughs> like it's not even of like anything more exciting than what they already know. Um, but but I I feel like most of the people who are our sub like contributors um, are not looking for a whole lot of rewards. Um, that I think they do want the content, they just wanna know like, we're okay. <laughs> um, but I, I think most of the people that are in our like giving community are sort of on the same value wavelengths as the project. Like we're not um, oriented towards like producing or end product or, you know, valuing people and art only when there's something to show um and and that like people's like our our spirits and our livelihood are as important as as what you see on the stage um and maybe for us like putting a little trust in that is is really um helpful as well in tr trusting in our community to be on that same same page um Paul, when you when we were talking about which platforms we're using and you were talking about Kickstarter and it being all or nothing and that like fear, that fear is so real. <laughs> it is so real. I mean, and like Jessica will tell you, we even had like people who support her at Kickstarter who bought like like week number two, end of week number two, they're like, I don't know if y'all are gonna right. make it. Or like, there is no believe. choice. There's believe. no choice but to make it, you know? Um, and it's funny because we've done crowdfunding before, like, you know, crowdfunding on an online platform. We did an Indiegogo campaign back in 2014 and we weren't successful with it um, and fell pretty short of our goal. Yeah. And we've never done a crowdfunding campaign that was this large. And I really think that, you know, really going in and asking for a part, a big chunk of like what we need or really just a part of what we need, but making a big ask, like really inspired our community. And then also that 
fear right. us. <laughs> like really pushed us to be like, you know, Eric and I would literally just like get on the phone at least once or twice a day and be like, great, who are we reaching out to yeah. today? What are you doing later? Like, can we be hanging out and like and post some ridiculous videos? Right. Um, one of the big things, because you mentioned, uh, Paul, you mentioned uh, Cuban rum. So I oh, had yeah. some rum from Cuba. And, uh, and so we threw, one of the great things about just having 30 days or having a set amount of time was we had to be as creative as possible. Um, so when you talk about rewards, like one of our rewards was a playlist, you know what I mean? So we had to be uh, creative about what is feasible and not too costly. Um, but within that, to incentivize uh, giving, we threw a free, well, it was free. No yeah. quotes. Yeah. A free party. It was a 90s themed rooftop party. It was free. Um, and I walked around with a bottle of Cuban rum. And to get a shot of rum, you had to donate. Um, so it was a lot of fun. We had a DJ there and yeah. lots of people showed up. Some people who didn't even know about the campaign. They just heard about a 90s rooftop party. They yeah. showed up in the 90s gear, we had a great time and this rum was a hit and then people gave more than, you know, they would have anticipated to give for a shot just because we were telling folks about our campaign and the mission of the company and the show. So we got, we had to be really creative within that 30 yeah. days because it was all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. We did a, instead of a, we did a like Facebook live-a-thon, yeah. um, you know, like taking the idea of a phone-a-thon where you're like sitting on the phone and people and you watch it and, and people are calling people and donating and we did it via Facebook live. One time we did it once where it was just the two of us That's at like true. nine o'clock at night, um, you know, and raised like, what, that night we raised like close to $300 yeah. and then we did it again and we invited some artists to come and just really started to like that pressure of being like, okay, well, if we don't get this 25 grand, like we're not getting any of it, yeah. just really pushed us to think really creatively and to think about different ways to reach our audience, our community and people beyond that as well. And how can we use it to continue telling the story about the Movement Theater Company, to tell the story about what to send up and all of the artists that we were working with um, and just, yeah. Yeah, um, just to say it was such a joy watching that happen. Like, because it was, it was seeing the strategy that you had to come up with. And I think both in advance of the campaign, but then in the like day to day of it, but seeing how it was both, here's what we're trying to do matched with the goals that you would set for yourself. Because early on and even like, we want to take this space. Yes, we are gathering energy, gathering money around the show, but we want to show people who we are as a company. Like we want to shout out all of the work that we're doing, our values. And that carried through in such a strong way, I think, in everything that was going on and the way that you led on social media, um, all of it. Yeah. How many, shots, of that. how many shots did you get? Did you sell? How many, how many did they, do? I got like, look, I could show you my bottles right now. <laughs> You're on mute. I can't hear you. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we can do an exchange. This is gonna, you know, did, I, you do the, did you do the whole bottle? Like, did you, uh, did you, yeah, yeah, no, we went through the whole bottle. Yeah. yeah. Well, right, it, that's, a, that's a great idea. It was really, it was, it was Eric's idea. And you were like, Eric. I don't know, like this seems like it's too far, like, no. but like people really got into it. And then people were like, oh, how much do I have to donate so that like all six of us can do shots? And they're like, right. oh no, no, Deidre, you're doing it with us. Like I'm donating for you too, you know? And it really became, you know, that whole vibe, like when you're at the bar and it's somebody's right. birthday, except it was like going towards the movement, you know? And so it was, <laughs> it was, it was we yeah, talked a lot of And I walked I around. I love that. I love that. He was so creative. I, I had a sign on my back that was taped to my back that was like, donation station. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, and I think uh, a great thing that Jessica mentioned about our campaign was it really leaned into our personalities yeah. as well as the work. Because one thing that we're very clear on as a, uh, 
our faces are part of the movement theater company. We can't separate that from the work is really important, but people see us and get to know us. And so our personalities and letting that shine through um, in the midst of the themes of the work was really important so that people saw us as fun, as, as, uh, as artists, as creatives, as uh, funny, quirky, determined, you know, all the different things that are, are part of our personalities, as well as we have this show that we want to do. Yeah. yeah. And when, and when you, you know, uh, Viviani you mentioned in our call yesterday, and Paul, I think you brought this up too. Actually, all of us have kind of brought this up, this idea of like crowdfunding as liberation, right? And, you know, using Kickstarter and using this campaign to also be, to like take up that space of like, yes, I can be a like fierce producer, but I can also like, party and have shots on the weekend and like the work will still, you know, the work still gets done. We can take up this space. We can show the many facets of who we are. We're not always just like struggling and like in the fight, you know, <laughs> sometimes we're just like out on a Saturday and at like the African-American day parade, you know, um, and all of those things. And also being a platform to do that too. Yeah. This idea of is crowdfunding an opportunity for liberation for historically marginalized communities and liberation. Yeah. Liberation from, you know, these predominantly white organizations who aren't letting us through their doors, liberation from being able to, you know, have community come together and fundraise this way and different kinds of ideas of what that can mean. Um, what, you know, liberation can mean many things. I don't, I'm interested in this question, though. Any other thoughts on that? And, you know, can crowdfunding offer opportunities for liberation for people of historically marginalized communities? Um, I think we talked about this, Viviana, uh, about just kind of, there's a lot of different levels of, of liberation, I think, that crowdfunding um, can give you access to. Um, one is you don't have to wait for a third party to give you your money. Um, often as an artist, when you propose a project to a theater, um, they often uh, receive the money on behalf of the project and then distribute it for, for, for people. It goes into their, um, it goes into their fund, their, their account, and then it goes through their bureaucracy on you know, the timing of the release of money, how much, um, all those things are around uh, just kind of nonprofit admin. And sometimes, you know, that money can be caught up in other expenses that are not related to your work. And sometimes the artist can suffer because of that, either delayed funding, delayed pay. Um, a, lot of, a lot of nonprofits use funds to cover for other expenses um, by balancing, you know, well, we're going to get this money um, to pay this this debt, and then we're going to have to use your money to pay that. But we'll we'll get another grant to pay you. That's just some some kind of you know strange financial um, nonprofit kind of. I don't know what you call that when you you know anyway. Um, I felt liberated. I feel liberated when when I get money directly to me, and I don't have to wait for a five hundred one c three to cut me a check. Um, so I look for more opportunities to get money to directly in the hands of artists, whether that is, um, you know, grants that fund art artists uh, directly and not through the 501c3 um, or the crowdfunding is perfect because it goes right to you. Um, so I, I feel like that is, is something to, to consider to, to offer people out there who are thinking about, you know, um, is it worth my investment doing a crowdfunding thing? Well, think about, you know, the, the, the award of a grant in which you don't see the funds for six to eight months or even longer, um, maybe a year. So that, that is a type of, of liberation. Let's get started right now. I don't have to wait. I think I might add on to that too, that I think the, the opportunity to tell your story in your own way um, especially if you're working in a space where you're being presented or produced, there becomes a marketing language around what you're doing. You get put into a certain box, but here's a chance to 
say why something is important, why you're passionate about what you're working on, the inspiration for it, your values, all, all the like recognition that you want to put into the work, you can take up that space on the project page. You can do that in your social media and your email campaign. Um, and I think there's something to that. Like you get to determine how you're shaping the show, which is great. I just want to offer that I think there is liberation in um, the donor pool being diversified. So being able to see that there were, you know, people of various economic statuses, uh, background, you know, ethnicities who poured into the project. Whereas I think when we think of arts funding, there is a very stereotypical either white male, white female person who's giving the most um, and or giving most often. And so it's wonderful that, you know, a 22 year old trans person who is an artist can give the $15 that they have and can feel as, uh, as much of a contributor to the arts as the person who may look completely different, be in a completely different socioeconomic status, they can both contribute and they both can feel like they are a part of the movement theater company. And I think that's a, that's a form of liberation because within the this traditional forms of uh, raising money, this person has the power and all of the power. Uh, all too often. So I think crowdfunding allows us to uh, diversify the, the donor pool and that is liberation, liberating. Yeah, that's all great. Um, I think love is liberating too. I think love is definitely liberating. And when you see your friends donating to your project, I really get like a feeling of love, like, wow, my, my friends are putting their money into my project. They're not a big funder. They're not a foundation. You know, they're not a corporation. These are somebody's coffee money or somebody's gas money. Um, and, you know, just today I, I, got a new, I got a new funder, a new donor, I'm sorry. And, you know, she's another theater artist just like me. Um, and that's a lot of my pool actually is other artists uh, who are just like, hey, you know, I like what you're doing. Um, here it is. Also, I think you're right, absolutely right, um, about what you said about what, what do donors look like. When I first set out for this um, Patreon campaign, I wanted to see how many of my donors would actually respond to um, kind of like an ethnic-based, racial-based, uh, identity-based project. Would I be able to, to recruit Latino donors? Um, would I be able to recruit, recruit black folks to, to get involved in an Afro-Latino idea? And my biggest donor is, is an um, African-American woman. Um, and to me, that's, that's awesome. And she's, she doesn't just help me with funding. She like gives me other people I could talk to for money. Um, and I know her, but I also feel like when, when, I, when I get the response from people, it's like, wow, I, I, people care. They, they want to see you do something well. And you feel this... This idea like, yeah, people do do love what I'm doing. Then I feel super love, you know? And I just want to tell everybody, this person's so amazing. They just gave me $20. I always love that. Yeah, I mean, when we really went and broke it down, we got, I think it was 363 donors. Um, and when you do the math, that means that the average donation is actually in the like $25 range. You know, and so to really go and think about that and, and we're, you know, at the movement, we, we do various donor campaigns and one campaign we have is $10 makes moves. And just to see how that is mirrored, even in our Kickstarter campaign about like, and those smaller donations in all honesty, often meant like yeah. so much to us because, you know, we knew that that was somebody's coffee money. We knew that they were like, well, like not going out this week. I'm like giving it to you. And it was like, it really was, it was huge. Yeah, I want to speak yeah. about the sorry the the idea of the future of crowdfunding in this way um, because I think we're also talking about um, all of our crowdfunding campaigns that we're speaking about are only one piece of a larger budget, right? I think I think 
for the most part, there's, you know, other forms, other donors, other grants that are happening besides just the crowdfunding portion. And so in terms of thinking about the future of crowdfunding, um, you know, what needs to happen in order for us to be able to stay, to be fully de only dependent on crowdfunding, to have full liberation in that sense. Um, does that make sense? Is that something anyone can speak to? What, what is the future of crowdfunding in that way? Did you see someone said, uh, can we use cryptocurrency? <laughs> I do, I do think like uh, the future of crowdfunding would be about the future of us figuring out how to mutually benefit each other through these kinds of network-based um, uh, funding mechanisms, whether they're online or other, other means of doing it. I got to think a little bit more about that, but how do we bring more people into supporting work? How do you um, diversify the, the fundraising um, methods um, how do you sustain uh, fundraising efforts? Um, how do you continue to recruit new people into your circle? Um, yeah, I mean, those are good questions. What the what the future is, and and how do how how do we get people involved who don't have money? I was uh, thinking the same thing um, along the lines of the last statement you said, Paul, that like the future of crowdfunding might include non-financial contributions um, and maybe like a, like a giving circle component, like an accountability portion, um, or maybe like, um, like a pool, like a, you know, you give to like one kind of portfolio and it has like a bunch of different kinds of work that are all linked linked to each other, um, how, how do we just connect like the different campaigns that are happening so that we're all informing each other's work? Yeah, and I think also another thing that I just wanna bring into the space too is that I think as communities of color and you know marginalized folks in general, like crowdfunding, while it may not have been on like Kickstarter or Indiegogo or what have you, I think it's actually always been like very much a part of how we've been able to survive. You know, I mean from like people having rent parties back in like, you know, the 70s and the 80s, where it's like that's actually just been part of like our our ethos right from and from financial financial stuff but also from you know uh not non-financial gifts too about like oh okay well like i've got you know i've got all the all this paper like you can have this papers so that you can print things and this sort of bartering system this which has just been the the only way for us to to, to make work into into live and to exist so i think just want to call that out into the space as well that it's just it's been part of one of our tools to survive. Yeah, it's part of our decolonization. Jessica, please go on. Okay, I, I think I really appreciate what I think several of you brought up now that if there's a way for crowdfunding to incorporate the non-financial, how do you make that ask in conjunction with it? Because there's whatever base financial reality you have, but if somebody can offer you the space, if they have the props that you need, how do you turn that moment into, like, here's my vision, here are the things that I'm looking for, and letting it be that instead of just the financial value of each of those items, like that to me is really exciting. Because we're still, I think, in the midst of confronting in crowdfunding that we have a small but mighty audience that's supporting theater. And if we were to look at just it being about fundraising the entire budget of a production, that to me is a, a different kind of challenge and relates to the, the ways that we undervalue theater in our culture at large. But your vision is one that I think is a pretty exciting one. And one that, I don't know, like if we can go running with that, holy shit. Yeah, well, because I think we've been talking about how crowdfunding liberates us from these larger organizations, the 501c3s, both grant and theater organizations, and liberating our narrative so that we can have our own, you know, voice in how we want to talk about our projects. And then also liberating us eventually, it seems, 
from the actual monetary, the dollar as we're, we all work with now. Um, and that is also part of the chains of colonization to me and of, of you know, white supremacy and all of the systems of marginalization. So if we're able to even remove the actual currency, the middleman there, middle person, man, man I mean, of course, it's, it's the man. <laughs> of course. Yeah, but, um, but, you know, and, and that's, that's the potential future that we're talking about and seeing and maybe envisioning. Um, so yeah, we have 30 minutes left and I want to take time to uh, go to some questions we've been getting from the virtual audience, uh, which one is interesting. It's going back to this idea of, of money and working with money, but there's actually two questions that are kind of similar. I'll say them both and then you can speak to parts of them. Um, so is there any concern or ways to avoid exhausting grassroots donors with campaigns? And connected to that, I think, is how do we get around the feeling that we are constantly shaking down our own communities that we know have very limited resources over and over again? I think we kind of touched on parts of this, but any thoughts for those questions? Um, I think part of it is how do you approach it not just as an ask, how do you approach it as an invitation like come into this world that I'm making, be part of what is going on. Um, like what you saw with the movement theater companies campaign where it's like kind of like get caught up in the joy of what we are doing. Um, I think that it's a, a tonal thing um, that is a little different from how some folks will traditionally go after their communities uh, to make an ask. Um, yeah, I think that that's important. Absolutely, as well as keeping in communication. If you go to make an ask, you know, you're running a campaign, it ends, you make an ask, come to see the show, and then you go quiet until the next time you need to make an ask or you need them to buy another ticket, it's hard. So how do you look at your community more holistically? How do you kind of, um, Paul and Kit, what you were talking about, like, here I am working on this song, here I am in this moment, so that they're brought along on your journey as an artist and they get to more organically participate. Um, I think those kind of things help with the exhaustion just because it's not about an ask, it's about a relationship and tending to that at that point. Yeah, I think also, um, <clears throat> like what we've all been saying, right, about like passing around the same $20, $25 too, and really embracing this giving circle, you know, idea and mentality. I think one of the things that we really try to do with the movement is make sure that we're going out and we're supporting our artists. We're supporting the artists that gave to the campaign, whether it's giving to their campaign, whether it's including their shows in our upcoming e-blast, going to their shows, um, and just showing up and and, 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 you know, continuing that relationship that was built and also, you know, paying it forward and paying it back and, and all of those things. Um, and I'll offer that, yeah, it's at the, at the core, it's about relationships. So I think one of the things that we were successful at was making sure that the campaign wasn't just tied to the show. So that the next time, if we do have to crowdfund again, people will know they're giving to us. Uh, whether that means us, the personalities and the people behind it, or us, the theater company, but, uh, th and they will be excited because they'll remember us from last time versus if it seems, and it, it all will depend on your organization and the project, but if it just seems solely about the project, it can become, okay, well, you all did it. <laughs> you know, you, you did that project. So you, you, you would still need to convince people to give to you all. But I think when you can focus on the who that's behind the project, it can really help so that uh, your audience or your potential donors begin to understand a relationship that if you have to ask again, they are still invested in that relationship. I also think about trusting in both, one, the abundance in our communities, and then two, the patience in our communities. When I follow a campaign, I want to hear from them, and I want an opportunity to support them in their second, second rounds of, of crowdfunding or giving. Um, I, like, I always want to know um, when I'm attached to, to something. And so 
um, sort of like trusting in in the feeling that like people really, really actually want to know what's up with you or your project or what's even in your sphere. Like um, Eric and Deidre were saying, who who are you friends with that are doing great work as well? Who's out there? Um, I think for Interstate, we also tried to go to all the other shows in the New York Musical Festival and we tried to um, show up and 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 support other campaigns and see see what people are doing because I, I feel like that also makes like your own work stronger if your work is in dialogue with your community's work. One of the things that um, was cool about the Patreon um, campaign was it was relatively new when I started and so one of my one of my one of my funders who was, who was already funding the project actually asked me that they would give me a matching grant if I let them talk to my donors. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Uh, so I had to actually email every one of the people who support my Patreon campaign and be like, look, you know, this funder wants to talk to you about, you know, why you're helping me. And um, everybody did it. They were, and I was like, and if you, and if you guys all talk to them, I get $5,000. So it's like you're doubling your donation just by setting up an appointment. Now it was a little bit of work, you know, I had to reach out to everybody individually and say, um, they're going to talk to you. And they're like, what are they gonna ask me, Paul? Are they gonna ask me about my bank account? I'm like, no, no, they're gonna ask you, why are you, why are you supporting me? And why, do you, why did you choose to do it on Patreon? Um, and I got like a total commitment from everyone to, to and, and I asked them like, and then tell me what they asked you. So people wrote me back. They're like, well, they just wanted to know why I chose to support you um, and why I was doing it online and, and you know, the different fears or, or advantages that they had. Um, and, and I do remember, you know, some people, some people are still reluctant to put their, their credit card on, on online, you know? Um, and, and I know that other folks also are just like, so down for you that no matter what you put out, they're gonna roll out whatever they have for you. And, and so the, the responses to, to the, um, the, the interviews that they had to do with the funder were all super positive and just kind of reinforced the kind of like, um, it reinforced the value of the work I was putting out. It reinforced the friendships that we had made um, and it showed, I think it showed the funders that, you know, um, my, my group of, of donors were, were unique, um, at, you know, I think demographically, but also that they really cared. Um, they, they wanted to be part of that process of um, what, what happens with this project. And, and, and I, do, I do think that's something to, to really, um, I guess, highlight about the relationships that you do create based on the crowdfunding and, and they're not like, you know, always the same type of relationship. Everybody has a different relationship with you as a, as a donor. But what I do find is that it, it gives um, an opportunity to, to be involved in something um, and feel like you're connected uh, in the development of a piece. And I loved writing everybody's name who donated on my program. You know, I put everybody, all 26 people, I put their name in the program. I said, these people, you know, gave individual money for it. And I felt really good about that. Just to say, hey, look, you're in the program. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have another question from an independent artist. What should we know as freelancers regarding our tax liability for this taxable income? Getting to some nitty gritty here, but important information. Patreon sends you, um, Patreon gave me a 1099. So they sent me um, all the money that I had uh, received and said, you know, this is, this is how much you're getting. Um, you, you have to turn in as a 1099. So yeah, you got to pay taxes on the money. Bottom line, just like any contract. Uh, just in terms of getting prepared for that to anticipate it. Um, so maybe that means like crowdfunding for it. Um, you know, some people crowdfund for the fees for, for their capital campaigns, their, their, for the to use the platform. 
um, I think budgeting and anticipating that you're going to pay, um, I think we budgeted like 20% or something in there for, for any sort of tax related things. And then um, just another really practical um, insight is to get an accountant and not try to do it yourself. Yeah, I think, and we're in a little different situation because we're an organ, we're incorporated. But I just know also, especially with all of the tax laws that are changing for independent artists and how you can write off expenses and things like that, it's changed a whole lot. So, kids' advice of getting an accountant is super, super, super important because it's really changed what you can write off and how much you can write off as expenses. In that, it's like completely different. So definitely get an accountant. And whether you get an accountant or you're working on your own, um, I know for Kickstarter, if you go to kickstarter.com slash taxes, we're not gonna give you like all the ins and outs, but we'll give you as much information as we can responsibly to tell you like, these are the different thresholds. But if you're working with somebody who's not as familiar with the platform and the fees, it'll also, as they're working on your taxes, give them a little bit of a background and an understanding of how it works. Awesome. We have another question from Brandon C. Smith on Twitter. What advice would you give before you launch your campaigns? Also, can you talk about being creative about engaging to donate outside of crowdfunding? All right, let's, we'll go for it. Um, so in terms of before launching, I think it's really important to uh, have content uh, set up. <laughs> so whether that's uh, a, no, a certain amount of videos, at least one, perhaps two, three, four, um, but as many videos as you can, uh, photos with uh, ideally text in the photos. So text that says, Please give, give today. The first 48 hours are really important. Um, having photos that communicate the message without someone having to read the caption was really effective for us. Um, and I think having some donors set up so that as soon as you launch, you have some money in there because someone who launches and did not tell anyone and no one was anticipating it, if you launch on a Tuesday and Wednesday that shows up on someone's feed and it still says zero dollars, it looks like you spent a day making no money. And that doesn't look good because people want to give to someone who's winning already. So it's really important to, before you launch the campaign, set up some friends, family, or whoever to give within the first 48 hours because those first 48 hours are crucial to make people look at the campaign and say, wow, they, they built some momentum. Let me keep that momentum going as opposed to wow, they need somebody to give, you know? So I think all of those content and building up some donors ahead of time are really important. Yeah, and another another bit of advice that Jessica gave us too was really like, don't be too precious with the content either. You know, we're, you know, a lot of the, it's, it's taking place on social media. That's so immediate, that's so fast. And I think once we really like relinquish some of that pressure for it to be like, oh, so perfect. There's so many like, collage apps that make it like really easy to just like throw something up there um and and like releasing yourself of that too is also um really helpful when you're prepping for the campaign and when you're creating content during the campaign yes to so much of that um you hit all the like the important points i think i'd add on to that like think about what you want the campaign flow to look like at what point do you want to be at in two weeks? You want to be at the 50% just so that you're able to gauge, am I going at the speed that I want to go? And kind of knowing like in the first week, this is how I think I want to approach communication. Like this is what I want to accomplish on social media. To your point, like having the content ready for that will take so much stress out. Um, and having, in addition to people who are going to give, have your people who care about you, who care about the work, also lined up and ready to share because that'll take some of the weight off of you as individuals when you know that you've got 10 people who are ready to go just scream from the rooftops about how amazing you and this work is. Um, I'd also add some budgeting is really useful. So um, just like uh, Eric 
and Deidre said, we also rate, did crowdfunding on different platforms um, from individual contributions to Kickstarter to throwing um, a couple of parties. And all of those things are crowdfunding. They just look really different. Um, and so setting a goal for each one. So, you know, if your project is the pie, you know, you're gonna do $20,000 in parties, $20,000 in um, Kickstarter and $20,000 in individual contributions. And then that, I think that's kind of what ours look like. And then some like giving circle and grant money is, is really useful to do so that you're you know, striving towards all those goals. Um, and then tailoring those goals to what you know your folks want to do. I mean, some projects want to party more than others. And I think that's really um, important to know. I would say on creative ways of engaging people to donate outside of crowdfunding is um, just what are points of collaboration that you could offer? Um, you know, what, what or, or how could folks collaborate with you that don't include donating on the on the site? So for instance, you know, you need certain things created like, oh, I need this to be videoed. Um, uh, I need photos of this event. Um, or, you know, I'm currently trying to, to negotiate space right now. Like I'll offer this amount of free activities in exchange for X amount of hours of uh, rehearsal space. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 I feel like, I feel like what kind of effort do you want to, to make in creating collaborate collaborations? I think ultimately crowdfunding is kind of like a collaboration. It's a big collaboration. Can we measure collaboration outside of how much people put into your project um, monetarily? And what are really cool ways of collaborating where you could be like, hey, um, I really appreciate the work that you do in this field and I could use that. Let's, let's figure out a way that, you know, we, we, we um, mutually help each other. Um, I'll let you take photos of my uh, collaborators. You can use them for your stuff. I'll use them to promote my stuff. And hey, we'll credit you on the, on the, on the um, crowdfunding thing. That's just one way. Um, it doesn't always have to be financial. Uh, and I think it's even better when you can find ways to collaborate with people that doesn't necessarily include only money. You're going to need the fun. You need the money. Um, it's, it's hard to offer, you know, space in exchange for plane tickets. But um, there, there's, there's times when you can certainly support artists without offering money. Yeah. Related to supporting artists, what can cis white artists do to help with crowdfunding for artists of color? I mean, amplify, share, support. I think jumping into whether it is financially or looking at what you as an artist have at your hands that you can provide and share, like kind of looking at that and offering that forward and then helping spread the word about it. Because like become part of that community in the way that you can related to that campaign. But I think in that moment, like the sharing and looking for, yeah, an opportunity to help them tell that story is important. The projects that the um, three of us are talking about here by artists of color is like a major accountability counterpoint. Like no one can say there wasn't an opportunity to support our projects because we put it on a very public facing platform. So when I think about how white folks can be in um, support of, of our projects, it's to be very tangible about it. If you've got funds and you've got money, just make a donation. If you have power and privilege in certain spaces, just use it. Um, and crowd, crowdfunding, I think, gives, gives a really clear way to do that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, the platform has been created that folks, white folks can give and uh, support, but also share and also uh, speak to the value of the work. I think that was really uh, important 
for us as uh, producers of color, producing artists of color, because there are uh, institutions, predominantly white institutions, that will hire a black playwright and or a playwright of color and produce their show. And that's wonderful. But for us to be four producers of color, uh, producing works by artists of color, that was huge. And to be shouted out and celebrated by our white cisgender folks was really important in terms of them utilizing their privilege to highlight us. So I think speaking to the importance, not just giving, but also also speaking to the importance of the work is really uh, something that folks can do. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. You guys are all on point. Yes, it is now on the record what you can do. Um, so I guess we'll do one more, two more questions because we have 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's see, for those on the panel that use subscription crowdfunding websites to raise funds on a continual basis, how has having that monthly financial support positively affected your overall health and well-being and hashtag work-life balance, if at all? Um, it's, it's huge. It's huge. I mean... <laughs> It's got to be like one of the biggest pulling attractive points for Patreon is that you're going to get money every month. Um, but you only get as much as you actually raise. So if you're only pulling $10 a month, I don't know if that's a, 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 a you know, a great balance. Um, I quit my full-time job to focus more on the live, um, the, the health balance, because I was trying to be an artist and a nonprofit um, administrator, and it was just unhealthy. Um, so I think one of the things you end up doing when you have more time is figuring out how do I, you know, fill in the gaps of the funds that I don't have anymore. Um, the cool thing about, about doing Patreon is that it is, you're telling a story, your story, and you're getting paid for it online. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with it. It's already a promotional platform for your work right there. So if you don't have money, money to, to keep up a website, you can actually generate this. That is a platform for you to promote your work online and make money at the same time. There's a pay button right there. Boom. Um, and, and, I, and, you know, if I gave it, if I gave Patreon, maybe, 10 hours a week, I could probably get a lot more money on it, but I don't, I have to also create work, um, rehearse work, <laughs> fundraise on grant proposals, teach and take care of my children. So it's like, you know, there's only so much time you can spend asking people for money. Thank God the people might hate me. Um, but I, I do think like uh, the, the benefit is um, having fun with it, uh, seeing what you can put on there that actually gets people's um, uh, attraction. So it is, it is also really nice to get money in your bank account every month. I, I can't say that any more emphatically than that. It's nice. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that there's um, the stability of knowing that there's a little bit of income every month is really great, um, especially because there's, there are always unanticipated expenses that pop up. You never know when you're going to have to um, pay for us someone to come in last minute to do something or to uh, everyone who's here knows what it's like when you need extra set pieces or more money for props and design or um, at, at the very least, you always wanna pay everyone more. <laughs> you, every, everyone who's working with you, especially for folks who have projects with other folks of color or queer and trans folks, you know, we all want our, our directors and stage managers and assistance and, and folks to get paid more. So it's, um, it's really great to know that there, there is a little bit of a um, wiggle room there. Awesome. Yeah, so we only have five minutes left on this time together. Um, so I'd also love to ask if there's any other resources that you'd like to share in terms of links or, you know, 
places to go to get more information on how to be successful in your crowdfunding um, beyond this live stream panel. And maybe we can put those links in the comments as well. Um, I'll share that the conversation that I had with the producing artistic leadership team on you know, how they accomplished their 25K in 25 days campaign, that's available transcribed um, on the Medium page at Advancing Arts Forward. So www.advancingartsforward.com and then you click the Medium little icon, it'll show up there in the list. But yeah, any other resources to share with people after beyond this conversation? I'm gonna do it. Oh, go for it, Kit. You might be able to point people in directions like when they have like specific questions, but for, for us in, in thinking about how to structure our campaigns, we just looked at other ones that were doing the same kinds of things we wanted to do. Um, people that were raising the same amounts of money in the same amount of time, people that are doing the same kind of work. Um, so I, I think like a great thing to do is just to go and look at, at what other folks were doing, what other re what rewards they were offering, how long did it take them to do it? How many people subscribed? Um, Yeah, I think that's an underutilized resource, actually, because there is a wealth of inspiration that if you, even if you're just clicking through like other theater projects in New York or Ohio, like you can kind of get a sense of what the community has been up to. Um, I would also, again, shout out Viviana, the piece that you do with the Movement Theater Company covers so many of the best practices and how to do it well, that that's great. Um, and I would add that we are actually spending the next two months at Kickstarter trying to help performing artists get ready for fall shows. Um, if you go to our homepage right now and click on performance in progress, it'll take you to a, a separate site where you can sign up right now for a crowdfunding bootcamp where for six weeks you will get a, an email once a week saying, here's what you need to do this week, the questions you should answer, some campaign inspiration, words from artists, um, just to kind of walk you through best practices that we know from our end. We'll have a webinar, we'll have some events in person in New York and London as well, but that's a great resource. Um, and year round, Kickstarter has a creator handbook in its footer that covers all, all the setup and what to do when you're running your campaign that I think is a great opportunity to just walk through what we know inside here um, and to try to help inspire you on your road. Uh, okay, so I don't, I don't have a link, but I have a bunch of words in the best. Um, I think uh, content, content, content. I think that's super helpful when you're thinking about uh, diversifying the message and also updating people. Everybody wants to feel like a hero. So one of the things that we did was we might have a picture that says, you know, five days left, uh, $700 more to go. Um, and so someone could then be inspired. Oh, well, I've got two, I've got $5. I've got, and we would update personally our statuses on Facebook and say, Hey, we're at 700, we're $761 away. Can someone give us $62 to help us get over that $700 hump? So personally updating people with how far, how close we are to that goal was really important. And then the other thing, uh, there was a question earlier about being creative. We knew we had some older folks or just people who needed to get the message in a different way. So we would call and say, hey, if you can write a check, we will accept the check. Um, then at the party, we had people Venmo us um, and because that was most accessible. They weren't ready to like sign up or do the whole Kickstarter thing, but they could Venmo one of us immediately. And then we found a way to get put that into the campaign. So I um, think being creative and also knowing what your personal skill sets are and what you can bring. I do musical improv, so we use that to incentivize. If you donate, I'll sing a song. I'll make up a song on the spot, but also bring your personal talents, whether that's writing, whether that's performing, whatever it is, to the campaign to help showcase you and get people more invested in the story of you all's success, the, the project and the organization's success. I just think everybody on this panel is just beautiful. And you guys, I'm so proud of you and all the work that you've done. And thank you for bringing us together, Viviana. Um, 
I appreciate this this opportunity to listen to my peers talk about their work. And I appreciate everybody's efforts to push the art forward and to you know, bring some justice to our current lives in this world through our art. So keep it up, everyone. Viviana froze. <laughs> Viviana, you're frozen. Right. I'm frozen. Oh. oh, someone echoed Paul's props and gratitude. Yes, thank you all. This has really been great and insightful, especially because uh, we're not familiar with the um, continual with, with Drip and with Patreon, but it was great to learn about that. So thank you all for that as well. Yeah, and I would just echo that it's always it's whatever we can try to share from within the crowdfunding platforms, but hearing the stories of you all who are making incredible work and have put the time and energy and sweat and tears into doing it, that's the best. So thank you for tuning in today and contributing all of that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, so since Viviana is frozen, I just want to say thank you again so much, um, and we'll follow up with some links. And um, 